So we'll talk about tectonics in more detail later after we uh, go through the earth forming materials and the internal processes of the earth. But um, I wanted to do a basic discussion of the development of the idea of our, around plate tectonics and how it came out of discussions about continental drift um, to provide that framework for us to have in place as we're thinking about different earth materials and processes. But also I think this is a good case study of how science works. And so we're going to do a little bit of a dive into history here. So, maybe a, a bigger dive into history, but we're not going to spend a lot of time back here. Just the uh, idea about continental drift, the idea that the continents as we see them today, or as people saw them in Europe 500 years ago, or wherever people were working, the, the idea that continents were not fixed does go back quite a ways, although it's never been, until recently, uh, a widely held view. So this guy, uh, Ortelius, he was a major map maker, and I have an affinity, an affinity for maps, so I thought it would be nice to throw him up here. Uh, but he had kind of an offhand comment, because he spent so much time you know, working with these maps, that Boy, it looked like the Americas were just kind of torn away from uh, Europe and Africa. And I don't know how many of you have noticed that looking at maps. Okay, I'm, I must have been in like, well, maybe not kindergarten, because uh, we we moved into town. So it must have been first or second grade. You know, e even in that young, you look at the map and you say, boy, those, those look like they kind of fit together. Um, so he, he threw out this idea about the Americas being torn away from Europe and Africa by earthquakes and floods, but, you know, this obviously didn't go anywhere. Uh, not, not in the 16th century. There would be you know, no way to really collect evidence around this, to think about it. You know, we really didn't have a geological perspective about the world at this point. Um, and, you know, map making is just kind of um, a description of where things are without any kind of necessarily any kind of, of mechanistic processing underneath it at that time, certainly. The guy who's really mostly uh, associated with this idea of continental drift is Alfred uh, Wegener, um, a German. Um, who was trained as an astronomer. He did a lot of pioneering work in meteorology and climatology, as I've got listed there. He's the one who really began to do, uh, build the case for continental drift, the idea that continents are not fixed in place, but they, they have the ability to move around the world. Um, so we'll talk about some of the evidence he put together which is also one of the questions I asked you on the quiz. Uh, I want to go into some of that in, in more detail. I want to ask you, though, what's wrong with this picture that I pulled off the Internet? You don't know Alfred, so take my word for it that it's a good likeness of Alfred, but what's, what's wrong with the picture? It's the idea that there are continental that there are plates on that diagram at all associated with Wegener because he had no he did not propose plate tectonics he proposed continental drift and so the reason why I ask that weird question what's wrong with this picture is to get that reinforce that in your mind that continental drift and plate tectonics are two separate ideas two separate theories hypotheses uh, they're clearly related. Uh, what we know about plate tectonics and how those plates function, what we know about that today explains continents and actually ocean crusts as well moving around. 
but that's not what Wegener proposed. All he proposed was, I have evidence that the continents as we see them today are not in, were not always in the place that they were. So like I said, he assembled all these, this evidence and we'll, we'll go through. Ultimately, he was rejected by the geological community of his time. Uh, his, uh, his ideas were not accepted, except by a handful of practicing geologists. And we can talk about some of the reasons why. And unfortunately, he died early on an expedition to Greenland, so he never really had a chance to, uh, to be vindicated. Let's see, he died at age 50. He would have had to live about another 20 more years, which wouldn't be unreasonable. And, uh, you know, he, he would see the ideas come around full circle. So, um, you know, I asked you on the quiz what evidence that Wegener uh, put together. So what did you come up with? Okay, so we've got fossils that he pointed to. Anything else? Okay, so there's the um, fitting together of shapes. So we'll look at we'll look at some of these in a little bit more detail. But these are essentially the kinds of, of things. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think it might have actually been a reading some reference about uh, similar fossils in different places that, that triggered his ideas to begin with. But then, you know, he did for continental drifts sort of what Darwin did for um, evolution by natural selection. Spent a lot of time just accumulating evidence that supported the idea. Um, there's one big difference between why he was not successful and Darwin was that we'll talk about when we get to the point where we talk about why his ideas weren't accepted. Okay, so first, um, you know, he spent time documenting the, the kind of patterns that we've all talked about seeing. Um, the uh, fit of the continents actually works a little bit better if you do uh, continental margins rather than coastlines. So that's what's plotted here. You can, uh, you can see that, for example, in South America has a continental margin <clears throat> under the ocean but still part of the continent that extends out from the coastline, especially in you know, like areas down in here. And uh, you know, um, things fit even better when you take those uh, those structures into account. So that's that's a clue. The fossil evidence is this kind of evidence. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have different. Uh, Let's see, these would be probably late Paleozoic uh, reptiles and, um, yeah, it would have all been late Paleozoic. Uh, for example, uh, Sydneynethus uh, fossils are found in South America and in Equatorial Africa. And for this uh, Glossopteris, um, I think it's a fern, fernish kind of plant, you see it in South America, you see it in Southern Africa, you see it in Southern in India, you see it, fossils of it in Antarctica and um, Australia. So all, already you should see something a little strange going on here, right? Does this look like the kind of thing that will grow in Antarctica? No. Okay. So, uh, here's a puzzle. 
here's um, data that the natural world throws up. And we'll talk about how uh, Wegener dealt with it in a minute, but put yourself in the mindset of early 20th century geologists. How would you explain this pattern? So what I want, I'm, I'm going to shut off the recording for a little bit, give you time to get into some groups of two, three, four, whatever works out, and come up with what are the different explanations you might propose if you are trying to apply the, the lens, the perspective of an early 20th century geologist. Okay, so I, I think we've had about as much productive discussion as we're going to have in the groups. Uh, so, I mean, what potential ideas could you throw out? Land bridges. So, what does that mean? You threw it out, Grace, so you have to um, explain what it means. Okay. Um, there were just um, bits of we didn't know about in between the continents that um, animals could migrate across and then I guess drop, 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 drop. the sea level is rising and they can't see them anymore. Okay. So, yeah, if you, if you postulate land bridges, then you have to say, well, where'd they go, right? So, could sea level rise explain the fact that you know, we had land bridges before and we don't have them now. With the Bering Strait between um, Siberia and Alaska, yes. Because the, the, uh, the ocean basin there is shallow enough that during periods of high glaciation, so much water is sucked out of the ocean, the ocean level drops enough to expose um, a swath of land that animals and early uh, humans, well not even that early, um, like uh, 10, 20, 30,000 years ago, could have migrated across. That scenario is more difficult, uh, tying um, South America and Africa together by a land bridge, because how do you expect the depth of the Atlantic Ocean to compare to that? Okay. The ocean would have had to been really, really small for there to be exposed land all the way across. Assuming that the ocean basin is fixed and we're just moving the surface of the ocean up and down. How else might uh, land bridges go away? Let's say that we don't really have any, any change in sea level major enough to have the land bridge Well, wind erosion, yeah, okay. You know, maybe, well, you'd also have to explain why a continent like this and a continent like this would have this little tiny stretch of, of land bridging them. But, you know, maybe there was that little strip and it got eroded away. Or what people more likely proposed is, you know, a collapse of the ocean floor. Boom. Bump. Gandalf on the bridge. You shall not pass and you know, land bridge uh, collapses. Um, so that, you know, that's obviously a potential explanation, one that has a lot of problems. Even, you know, people back then saw that there were a lot of problems. Other potential ways of explaining the distribution. Spores with it? Poop? Yeah. Okay. We can say poop. Okay, so migration. You know, maybe these critters could swim. So if they could swim, 
what's what then do you have to explain about these distributions? Yeah, or why did they swim to here and not swim to here? Okay, so maybe there's a unique habitat here, there's a unique habitat here at 300 million years ago, and you had um, source populations here and some intrepid, intrepid survivor you got um, washed out on a storm and rafted on some, well, we didn't have coconut palms at that point, but you know, somehow made it over, established uh, in comparable areas. Does that kind of make sense though? Because it's like the bottom of the Amazon and then the Kongo Lee rainforest. Okay. You know, tying this area and this area and this area and these areas and here and here together by some kind of targeted dispersal to particular kinds of habitats. Lots of wind. <laughs> Lots of wind. Uh, interesting little band of subtropical uh, habitat here in Antarctica. Um, okay, so it, it, it's very convoluted. Right? However, if you allow the continents to move around and you fit them together, um, then you know, imagine that it's all one continent at some point. And here is a range for these guys. And here's the range for these guys, etc. So, um, continental drift solves some problems. It gives us uh, it gives us a simpler explanation in one respect, in that we don't have to you know postulate land bridges and then get rid of them somehow or weird migration patterns. Did you guys have any other uh, um, possibilities you brainstormed? Those are the two big ones, okay. Um, but it's perhaps not a simpler explanation because then you have to explain how the continents can move around. Okay, um, people mentioned the geological evidence and so when you actually fit these different places together on the basis of their shapes and then look at the geological formations you see specific formations that um, match up on either side of the, the rift. Um, again strengthening the idea that these geological formations were laid down uh, or intruded, you know, depending on you know, what kind of structure we're talking about, at a time when the continents were adjoined, and then when the continents split apart, obviously it split those down the, down the, down the middle. This, this down here is a little bit different idea. We would expect if the continents are moving around and bumping into them, bumping into each other, that part of that bumping would lead to different kinds of mountain ranges or rising up of the landscape, which is what orogeny means. Um, and so uh, we see things like the Appalachian Mountains range, which we know is a very old and ancient mountain range because it's been worn down quite a bit. Uh, we, could, we could come up with an explanation for how it arose if we're thinking about, you know, Africa ramming into the eastern side of what eventually becomes North America. This, I think, is an interesting example. Um, first of all, let's look here. This is a figure from Central Park. If you look at a number of the outcrops in Central Park, you will see these basically scrape marks that go across in parallel lines across them. These are not fractures. Um, these are not fracture planes in the rock. These are, the surface of the rock has been like someone came along with a nail and uh, scraping. 
These are done by glaciers. So as glaciers move across the landscape, they pick up rocks and other debris at the bottom of the, gl of the glacier. You've got tons of ice forcing these rocks across the pre-existing bedrock. Basically, you're going to mar the surface. And so when you see these uh, parallel striations in areas that had been, that it, that's been subjected to um, glacial uh, deposits, you know, typically those are the result of this kind of scouring process. So, I um, can't see it real well because of the toolbar down at the bottom here, but there are... Um, are similar kinds of uh, glacial deposits and striations uh, going back to the Permo-Carboniferous boundary. Okay, so Permo is from Permian. Um, and so the uh, we basically have evidence for glaciers in these areas mapped out in white and glaciers moving in the directions of the arrows there. So, um, how do we explain that in a uh, early 20th century geologist perspective? India is located where now? Yeah, do you associate India with glaciers much? No. Okay. Uh, Southern Africa, not so much either. Um, Australia, I mean, the, can you imagine a glacier in the Australian outback? Uh, yeah. So, if we're if we're seeing evidence of glacial deposits occurring in these areas, it's either one of two things. Either well, what would those two options be? I mean, what would it mean to have glaciers in India? It was either really cold in India or India was really cold in India. Right. So either we have the massive worldwide glaciation going from the poles to the equator, which we know has, now we know has happened a few times in Earth's history, um, or India was somewhere else more susceptible to glacial formation. We know at the same time that there were glaciers in India, there were, let me get this right, because this is off the top of my head, um, there were like coal deposits being laid down in England, <coughs> indicating that England at that time was basically a tropical, heavily vegetated, uh, swampy kind of area. Okay. So that's not consistent with worldwide glaciation. Okay? So if India is glaciated not because there's a worldwide glaciation, the other option is, well, India was likely somewhere else at this time. When uh, Wegener put the uh, continents together again, um, basically all of those glacial areas that we now see scattered across the globe would have been a continu contiguous um, glaciated area. And where would this most likely have been? The South, Pole. South Pole at the time. Now, Wager didn't make much of this, but modern-day ecologists really make use of, the, of uh, uh, this idea of continents moving around to explain the distribution of modern-day species. So we've got rat-type birds. Rat-type birds are just simply, these are the primitively flightless birds. These groups have never had wings, well, never had flight. Okay. They don't have the same hollow bone structure. It's clear that these have been terrestrial lineages all the way. And yet we see ostriches in Africa. We see emus in Australia. 
and cassowaries and kiwi birds and we see rias in South America. Um, so, you know, these birds don't fly, they're not good swimmers. How do we explain them being, as a group, restricted to these southern continents? They run on water. <laughs> no, the idea is that they, this group as a whole, would have originated when the southern continents were together in Gondwana land. And then as the bits and pieces of Gondwana land broke up into the different continents and moved around, they took their uh, Ratite bird lineages with them, and then they differentiated into the different species once they were geographically separated. I mean, this is not part of Wegener's evidence, but you know it, it is an important principle for explaining yeah, patterns of biogeography uh, that we see today. Okay, so we've got all these pieces of evidence. So why didn't all the geologists jump up and say, good job, that explains a lot, let's get on board with this? He lacked the technology. Okay, he lacked the technology. We'll come back to that. And I think that's an important point because you know, as we look at the development of, of area after area after area of science, the uh, development of instruments and technologies that, make, that allow us to ask new questions and collect new data really are important for uh, how those areas develop. There's a more fundamental issue, though. Yeah. So, you know, for a, a good theory, you need to be able to not only explain patterns in nature, but you have to have a reasonable mechanism for carrying that out. And um, you know, Wegener basically had, well, uh, the Earth is spinning. And, you know, maybe as the uh, Earth spins, continents get thrown further away from the pole, so they move more <coughs> toward the equator. So if Gondwana land had all been on the South Pole, and they're spinning around, maybe the... Um, you know, the force of that is going to move the continents away. The, the other, um, he also uh, talked a little bit about, you know, maybe the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon, you know, these tidal forces could perhaps uh, push things around as well. The problem, though, is that he's proposing that we have the, uh, let's, let's see if I can draw um, You know, he's basically thinking about the continents as a lighter land mass that is kind of floating on the basal crust, the oceanic crust. And what he actually had to propose because of, you know, the geological frameworks of the time is that these forces somehow push the continents through the crust like an icebreaker going through, you know, ice jam uh, up on the Arctic. So continents are going to be basically being forced through the crust. And um, so, you know, in order to do that, you're going to have to have massive forces. And you're going to have, have to have forces that are so intense that the continental masses themselves are going to be broken up. So, um, so there's a problem there. He doesn't have a good mechanism that will 
that will deal with this. I used to want to, okay, so, you know, uh, no mechanism. I just want to make, a, a, make the point, though, that the geologists at the time didn't have really good alternative mechanisms either to explain what's going on. So, uh, how could they account for Wegener's uh, evidence? So, we've talked about the issues with the land bridges, which were, you know, a big proposal to, to solve some of that. Um, geologists at the time had no good way to explain the presence of mountain ranges like the Alps and the Rocky Mountains and, and, um, and Appalachia. Um, I mean, through volcanic processes you can explain one mountain, but it's hard to explain um, a, you know, a mountain range that's clearly not volcanic. And so, yeah, they were dancing around, theoretically dancing around, you know, talking about land bridges, uh, subsidence of different sections of the ocean, the idea that, well, you know, maybe we think the Earth is cooling off, and we know that spheres, as they cool off, they contract, and so a contracting Earth might have its crust wrinkled as it's shrinking, very similar to Lowell's ideas about uh, mountains on Mars uh, Alley, what we talked about last time. You know, is the plan of strength. The uh, basically the wrinkling of that crust as it shrinks is perhaps what's responsible for the mountain ranges. And, you know, maybe that's also responsible for there being land bridges at one point and then later they, um, they disappeared because they're destroyed. But it's not really very satisfying either. Um, just from a sociological perspective, it didn't really help that Wegener was a meteorologist trying to tell geologists how the Earth worked. Okay. So, uh, I mean, he did great work in climatology and meteorology, but um, didn't have the street cred among the geologists to, uh, to get them, many of them to accept his ideas. Right. Could there also be like, some political aspect to it him being German during the war period? Well, he was, uh, I don't think so. I mean, he was working in Austria and, um, you know, German science was very well respected. So, I don't think that's going to be an issue. And actually, he published his early volumes on this were even before World War I. Uh, and I'm not sure if he was even living in Germany at that time. Um, but, I mean, there could be, um, you know, nationality issues, not necessarily political ones, but just the fact that, you know, he's publishing in, in German and he's in Austria and, you know, maybe the English geologists, um, you know, the, the lineage following Maxwell and so forth, so all the geology that's going on in England not necessarily picking up in the scientific literature as much. Um, I mean, we still have those kinds of issues today. It's, it's less of an issue, but it could be part of it. Um, so again, uh, I, you, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about plate structure and function and you know, all of that more more geological detail because I want to look at this more of as a historical kind of, of exercise. But I, I do want to mention that essentially in the 50s there was a um, there was the institution of a lot of large scale science after World War II uh, there's a lot of m money being pumped into public uh, funded research. There are a lot of large uh, research projects going on. 
in particular the International Geophysics Year, the IGY, International Geophysical Year, um, was well, kind of the culmination of this, but all through the 50s there are these large-scale, big research projects. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis or interest in mapping the ocean in ways that it had never been mapped before. <clears throat> Why do you suppose there might have been a lot of interest in mapping the ocean following World War II? Is it because submarines were a thing now? Yeah, submarines were a thing. Um, you know, the ocean depths were of interest militarily, commercially, scientifically. Uh, we had new technologies. Uh, we, you know, had the ability to do sonar depth profiles and really get an idea of what was going on. We could drag magnetometers around because uh, there was a lot of... of uh, financial and resource support for these large uh, science projects. So we're collecting a lot of data. We're using new instruments, um, you know, as you mentioned, that we didn't have before, and getting a new picture of, um, of the world, specifically a new picture of the oceans. I just want to briefly highlight three things that we'll probably cycle back to more as we really talk in more depth about. Um, about plate tectonics and how it actually really does all work. One thing was uh, with the mapping of the ocean, the identification of these mid-ocean ridges, not only the mid-Atlantic ridge, but mid-ocean ridges. So as the uh, oceanography boats were going out, doing all these mapping studies, data were coming back, um, just came across recently an, an article about Marie Tharp in particular. Um, one of the few-ish women geologists at the time. Obviously not allowed to go out on the boat because, you know, we just couldn't have women out on the research vessels at that time. Uh, but she did tremendous work in, uh, you know, getting the data from all of these uh, sonar profiles and actually was pretty much responsible for this map, initial mapping of the ocean basins that identified um, these mid-oceanic ridges. And some of the uh, men she was, uh, you know, in the research collaborations with, you know, looked at that initially and discounted them because, oh, crap, you know, that looks like, that looks like continental drift. We can't be talking about that because we know continental drift doesn't work. You know, check your figures. What are you thinking about? But when it became clear that we did have these uh, these mid oceanic ridges, um, you know, that provided a very strong basis for plates and plate tectonics. And so, of course, um, <laughs> Neil Colley published the seminal paper, you know, laying this all out. She was never cited on it, which was kind of typical at the time. Um, but this, this is one of the key pieces of, you know, figuring out that there might actually be a mechanism that would allow the continents to move around. You know, related to this, um, they were taking samples of ocean crust at different locations. And now we had radiometric dating, so we could actually date, put dates onto the uh, different areas of the crust. And so what we see, if we look just in the Atlantic, what we see is the crust, the crust that's associated with this mid-Atlantic ridge is relatively young. And then the crust gets older the further and further away you get from that ridge. So what is your, what, how, do you, how would you then interpret that, those, those results? New crust is being produced where? In the middle, at the ridge. And then over time, what happens to that crust? It's pushed out. And so the further and further away you get from the ridge, you have older crust because it's the crust that was produced earlier and eventually got pushed further and further away. 
So, you know, this kind of data basically uh, sealed the deal for the idea that there are plates that are being produced, they're moving around. And then why then, for example, is South America moving? It's not because the continent is plowing its way through the crust. What's actually happening? The whole piece of crust itself is being pushed by all of these tectonic forces. That was um, just reinforced by this paleomagnetic data that I think we'll talk more about when we actually get to talking about the mechanics of plate tectonics uh, in more depth. But all these new pieces of data coming out of these big science studies um, uh, provided a mechanism that Wegener never had, which is he doesn't have to explain anymore how the continents can plow through the crust because now we have an explanation, a mechanism for pieces of crust itself moving around. And uh, I guess I just want to reinforce that in terms of scientific revolutions, this is one of the most massive and quickest ones. Basically, over the span of a couple of years, in the middle of the 1950s, the whole perspective of geology changed. You know, you basically went from the pre-tectonic, pre-plate tectonic worldview of, of geology to the post. And I know, I've, you know, I've heard stories of, of researchers at the time that would have um, papers in press that were still, um, well, the, the switch came so quickly that researchers would have papers coming out one right after the other with, with representing this, this flip in the worldview. Um, so this is not a, a gradual, uh, let the old geezers who believe in the, in the old ways die off and be replaced by the young. So that's why I think, uh, I think this whole development of plate tectonics is an interesting case study in how science works. Um, i tell you what, let's, um, why don't you take five minutes on the back of your quiz, just reflect a little bit about what lessons you can pull out of how science works based on you know, this historical development of the idea of plate tectonics, how it was, you know, how it arose out of this idea of continental drift, you know, why things were accepted at one point and they weren't earlier, you know, what, what are, I just want to, I, want, I just want to read your reflections about this.